Uh, this one's on gay marriage. It's going to end up being a response video to the 313 group, which is ma who is making a, their own um, video on gay marriage and their takes on it. What, what is what is Brain App's position on gay marriage? I actually don't know. I mean, wh my position on anything is like, well, what does the Bible say? And then that becomes my position. Because I actually don't have too many opinions left anymore. I have to look at the Bible to find out what they ought to be. <laughs> okay, so what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says that sodomy is a sin. It does not say that being gay is a sin. It says that sodomy is a sin. So you could be gay but never commit sodomy and then, you know, that's not a sin. Now, is there such a thing as a gay marriage where there's no sodomy involved? Well, I don't know. There are such things in heterosexual marriage where this couple never have sex together, and that's per totally permitted. In fact, that's the only place that sex of any kind is permitted, is between a husband and his wife, from the biblical standpoint. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, there was a death penalty assigned to adultery, um, certain cases of fornication. Fornication means that both people who are having the sex together are unmarried, meaning not married to each other or not married to anybody else. And they're man and woman. Okay, that's fornication. Sodomy, by contrast, is where two people are having sex together where they're of the same gender. That is punished by a death penalty in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Christ took away the penalty for adultery, which was stoning, in John 8. And yes, that passage, which is the first 10 verses in John 8, really does belong exactly where it is. It is a theme that John is using to begin and end the chapter. It begins and ends with stoning. It starts with the people wanting to stone the woman in order to get at Christ and attack him. And the chapter ends with them wanting to stone him. So all those idiots who claim that the Terry culpa Terry, which is what the adulterous part of the passage is called in Latin. All those people who claim that the Terry culpa Terry is not valid Bible, they're all idiots. Just throw them away. And some of them are really degreed scholars. They're idiots. Any brain out can look at the passage theme and see it belongs. And since Paul, I mean, John is quoting Christ, of course the writing style is not the same as John's. Because he's quoting Christ. And Christ is basing what he says throughout the entire chapter, starting at verse 1, on Psalm 16. He's tracking the psalm for the sake of his audience. And I cover that in my John 8 videos. So you can go look it up yourself. Now, I'm sorry that's kind of a long-winded explanation, but... The point is, is that legally, he, God, man, okay, ultimate authority, he takes adultery out of, away from, the death penalty. He's taking it out of the law, then. He's making it subject to whatever spiritual issue there is between the person and God. Because how does he end the adulterer passage? He says to the woman, don't sin that sin anymore. Go. So, if he's going to take adultery out, which in many ways was considered worse than homosexual sins, you had homosexual sins and then you had sins with animals. They were treated, they were bundled the same way. If he's taking adultery out, which is worse because you're already married to somebody, the penalty for fornication was less than the penalty for adultery. That was worse. You had to stone the, both the adulterer and the other person, okay, which is why John 8, 1 through 10 is so pregnant, because instead of taking the man who was involved in adultery along with the woman, this was a big point my pastor made, they only brought the woman before Christ. So they were trying to trap him. They didn't care about, you know, stoning her. Yeah, but he is without sin cast the first stone. So he took adultery out of the law. That means all sexual sins are taken out of the law. 
All right, so as a Christian, don't you have to regard that? I do. I mean, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, then state law might be whatever it is because a state is full of Christians and non-Christians. But I would not vote for a law that, other than, you know, like pederasty, because that's an actual crime. I would not vote for a law that made it a crime for two consenting adults, no matter what they are. Because Christ took adultery out of the law. So as a Christian, it would be wrong for me to vote for a law that made consent consensual sex of any kind a crime. Okay, that's between God and the individual. It's a sin still, but it's not a crime that the state has a right to a judge. Because the Lord took it out of the law in John 8. Okay, so where does that leave gay marriage? Well, in gay marriage, they're going to have sex or they're not. But in gay marriage, the way the issue is formed in the United States, it's got two prongs to it that I think you need to know. The first prong and the impetus for it is that when you got a gay couple, the one person in the gay couple wants to assign health benefits to the other person in the gay couple under the idea of spousal coverage. And unless the company or the insurer allows the other person in the gay couple to be counted as a spouse, then that coverage is not afforded. Now to me, that kind of issue should be the company's right to determine, because it's the company's insurance, and the insurer's right to determine who's covered. And there are insurers out there, because this is kind of related to my field of work. There are insurers out there who will grant spousal coverage to the other member of a gay couple. There are companies out there who will allow that as coverage. Okay, but then that brings in the next question. Are the two members of the gay couple legally married. See, because it's the, the idea is that, well, you have to be, they have other words for it in other contracts, in other insurance contracts. They call it like domestic partner, significant other, in other words, not requiring a legal institution of marriage. But in some of them, they require the, the both of the members to actually be married to each other for that health benefit to exist or that life insurance benefit to exist, or whatever it is in the contract. It seems to me that that ought to be the right of the company that's offering the insurance and the insurer to define what constitutes a spouse. If they're defining it as legally considered a spouse under the law, as is true for heterosexual couples. In other words, if you're a heterosexual couple and you're just living together, but not legally married, then the person living with you is not able to be considered a spouse. If you're going to have that rule for the heterosexual couple, then you've got to have that rule for a homosexual couple. All right, and it still should be up to not the state, but the insurer and the company. Well, then the, her the homosexuals can come back to us and say, well, look, if there's no state that allows me to get married as a homosexual, then I can't get this benefit from my company. So then the next step would be, well, then the law about whether you can marry as a homosexual couple ought to be a state-determined thing. There should never be a federal law on this at all. I'm totally against that, what was that stupid idea of a federal amendment back, I don't know when, that the federal law ought to decide, ought to ought to determine what's considered marriage. No. Federal law has no provenance, no justification on this issue. It has no right to declare what constitutes anything in personal life at all. That was what the forefathers fought to deny the federal government from the very beginning. States have a limited right to determine certain things that are more personal based on the state because, see, you can move with your feet. One state's going to have a law that favors marijuana, for example. 
<clears throat> but another state will be against it. Fine. You want marijuana to be legalized, you go to the state where it's legalized. See, that way you get to vote with your feet, and every state has the right to determine more about those kinds of laws. Federal government doesn't have that right because a federal law is one size fits all. And that's not what our United, we're United States. Okay? We're a federation of states. And so federal law is way overblown now, and it ought to be cut back. States' rights are being curtailed too much. We're not true to our original purpose, and our original purpose is better. So, would Brain Out be for gay marriage? Well, not personally, but if the people in my state vote for it, I'm not going to move out of my state because they do. Because of the, the origin and the nature of the rule. Okay? I don't believe in it. Gay marriage itself is not the sin. It's the sex that's the sin. And that's between the two people, whether they have it or not. So I can't say that the, that the gay marriage is a sin, although, you know, it's problematic. As a Christian, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from believing in Christ and being saved if you're gay. And there's nothing stopping you from having sex even though you're gay. You're not going to lose your salvation for sure. But it does inhibit your spiritual life. Okay, but that's a Christian thing. That's a spiritual thing. That has nothing to do with the state. What should the state allow? Well, it depends on what the people vote for. Okay? And I can't sit here and tell you whether there ought to be a law or not in my state, which is Texas, approving gay marriage. I don't know. Um, that's as far as I can go with it. Yell at me if you want in the comments. Peace out.